Uh, so very nice to have you all here at the um, Irish Writers Week weekend here in London uh, in partnership with Coach International Festival of Literature. I'm very delighted now to introduce to the stage uh, a special guest for this afternoon, uh, His Excellency the, uh, Ambas uh, the Irish Ambassador in London, Martin Fraser, to say a few words. Hello everybody um, and thank you all so much for coming to this wonderful occasion in the British Library, a, a celebration of Irish writing. Um, a, a, as ambassador, it's a great privilege for me to be here to welcome you all, to welcome the panel that you're about to hear from and very quickly, I'm not going to talk for too long, don't worry, um, but also all the, all the writers and all um, the creative people and all the people who help them, support them through publishing them, reading them, talking about them, listening to them all the people that help us here in London, uh, in the UK, and indeed at home as well. Uh, Irish writing is, um, is a theme of Irish ambassadors. Uh, it, wherever you go in the world, uh, Irish writing, Irish literature, Irish writers are known all over the world. They've had a huge impact all over the world, and it had a huge impact uh, in London uh, and in Britain as well. And of course, our, our, we share a common language, albeit the Irish clearly share it a bit better than some others, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm par I think I'm paraphrasing somebody badly, but uh, the, the, the links between Ireland and Britain, of course, which are at the heart of what we do in the Irish Embassy, trying to promote friendship and peace and prosperity in these islands, working together, uh, is very much encapsulated by the, um, by the links between the two islands expressed in literature and in writing. And indeed, some of the more challenging things as well, and I'm delighted to hear uh, earlier on there was, there was discussion of uh, Northern Ireland, Ulster, the six counties, the nine counties, the north of Ireland, and a few other places, uh, which are all remarkably similar, but somehow different. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to see so much emphasis now on Northern Ireland writing as well, Northern Ireland writers. And again, you hear some of that, and have it, had it already and will later on. Um, I remember when I was being taught economics, which is a non-fiction discipline, my, my lecture, well, is it? <laughs> anyway. There's a lot of economic fiction in this. I don't. I'm the ambassador. I mustn't. I mustn't digress. Um, but uh, I remember my lecturer saying to me that if you want to understand something, you should really read fiction. And in many ways, the blossoming of fiction about Ireland, and particularly about Northern Ireland, I think is a wonderful thing in recent years. And the blossoming of fiction about a new, diverse, open, mainly tolerant, but nonetheless changing and challenged country that Ireland is is a wonderful thing as well, and I'm delighted the programme today reflects that and programme tomorrow as well. Uh, I'd like to thank our colleagues in the British Library for, for hosting us, the Court International uh, Literature Festival, the uh, um, Doyle Hotels who have helped out, and everybody else who's associated with this wonderful weekend, and I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I would also like to acknowledge the, the amazing support of the Embassy through the, throughout this whole project and, and also Culture Ireland for their, their terrific support. And now our next panel, um, Ireland Today, will be hosted by uh, Patrick Frayne, uh, which who many of you would have heard from earlier on talking about the essay. Uh, he is, of course, a, a very popular essayist, a writer, a columnist for the Irish Times notably, and we're delighted that he's going to be hosting with us uh, Wendy Erskine, Emily Pine, and Suad Aldara. And we also have the wonderful Emma Dabbery, who was the sole, unfortunately, victim of the train strike today, and she is going to be here on the, on the big screen all the way from uh, Margate, um, where she was stranded today, but uh, very much here in spirit, if not in body, and she'll be participating just in the same way in the conversation. So please welcome our panel. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Patrick. Um, the subject today is the very small topic, Ireland Today, a writer's view, uh, which could uh, go in any direction, but I've got a very able panel here. Um, Swad Aldara, whose memoir of her journey from Syria to Ireland, to New York, to Ireland again, um, was recently nominated for an Irish Book Award. Uh, she's also a data scientist who's worked on migration subjects with UNICEF. Um, Wendy Erskine, uh, Belfast-based author of two excellent collections of short stories, Sweet Home and Dance Move, which came out very recently, uh, very much set in East Belfast. Um, she's also an English teacher. Um, 
Eberly Pine, author of the essay collection Notes to Self, and more recently the novel Ruth and Penn. She's also a professor of modern drama in UCD. And all the way over in Margate, uh, Emma Davery, the author <laughs> of Don't Touch My Hair and What White People Can Do Next, from Allyship to Coalition. Um, she's also an academic and a broadcaster. Um, I'm kind of telling you all their other jobs because <laughs> Um, when we were kind of talking about this before, Wendy said to me that she didn't think a writer's view is any more interesting than a electrician's or a nurse's view. And I kind of think she's right. And I think in the past, a panel like this, talking about Ireland today, like 20 or 30 years ago, I think it would have been probably four white male Catholic writers. And the reality now is that Ireland's a more pluralistic place the writing scene is much more diverse. And I think one of the consequences of that are people are much more rightly concerned with the idea that they can't speak for everyone. Um, whereas I believe Yeats always thought he could speak for everyone. Um, actually, I'd like to maybe start by talking about that. I mean, Emily, you constantly are looking at Irish fiction as a, as a professor of literature. Like, do you think that the role of Irish writing has kind of changed in that respect, that you're no longer meant to be pontificating from the mountain? I, I don't know about the pontification, <laughs> but I do think that, and we were talking about this earlier as well, I do think that the role over the past, say, 30 years has been to lead some of the changes that you're talking about, certainly in terms of changing the idea of Ireland. And so I have been teaching for several years, God, actually about 10 years now. Um, and I started out by teaching plays that were set in Magdalen laundries, and then plays about the industrial schools, and then plays about violence against women in Ireland, and other kind of really cheerful topics like that. But noticing how, so that first play, Patricia Burke Brogan's play, Eclipse, was from 1990, could not get produced in Ireland. She could not get a production in Ireland. And, and you know, we could say the same about, you know, there was no um, information about abortion. You couldn't travel. All of the, the ways in which um, people's lives were circumscribed 30 years ago that they aren't now. And how important it was at that time. But also my students, for as much as those things have changed and the last laundry closed in Ireland in 1996 and we've had both UN um, reports and a national report and there's a compensation claim, scheme and so on. There's th those plays I still teach because they're still not, that history is still not on the national curriculum in schools. So, you know, it's that, that thing of, of the work that literature still has to do and culture still has to do to fill a gap in, in, in kind of how people learn and how people know about this Ireland, both past and present. Um, on that subject, like, Wendy, are you conscious when you're writing stories set in a very particular place um, and a very particular time that you have a, any sort of political or social responsibility or is that like throwing too much weight on one writer? I think, if, I think if you're a writer, I think if you're any kind of artist, that your commitment should just be basically to whatever your particular artistic project or vision is. And that could well be that you want to um, present a particular social, political milieu, that you want to make some sort of point, but it could equally be not that whatsoever. Um, and you, could, you, you may wish to write something that is totally divorced from, from that particular aspect, and that's, that's okay too. Um, in terms of me, yeah, I, I write about quite a sort of circumscribed area, you know, a few streets basically in, uh, in East Belfast. Um, and really that wasn't anything super schematic. It was really just that uh, I didn't want to do too much research and this, yeah. this area presented <laughs> itself to me very, very conveniently. Um, and I, but at the same time, for me, what I do want to reflect, I, I want to write about class quite significantly. I want to look at the relationship between people's environment and um, who they are as individuals. Those are, those are important things to me. Um, would I want to criticise someone who didn't want to do what I do? Absolutely, uh, absolutely not. At the same time, though, as well, what I'm also hoping with what I do is that it also is, it moves beyond local colour literature. You know, yeah. I had somebody ask me one time, do you think you'll ever be able to move beyond these Belfast and I, I find that a, 
I find that a strange thing to say because nobody's going to say to somebody, do you think you'll be able to move beyond New York? Will you be able to move beyond London? Um, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be more complexity of experience somewhere elsewhere. Um, so that's what I'm that's what I'm happy doing. In the context of this, actually, like mm -hmm. it's called um, Ireland today, and there, I mean, it, that kind of glosses over the fact there's loads of different Irelands in metaphorical sense, but also in a very real sense, there's two mm -hmm. different Irelands, and you're part of one different political block up mm -hmm. there, up there. It's a terrible thing to say, sorry. Um, but do you feel, like, what's your thinking of that? Like, when you hear a title like that, do you feel you're being subsumed into, like, a greater Irish identity that doesn't reflect you? Or do you feel that that's relevant too? I probably feel both, Patrick. I kind of feel that um, it's relevant to me. I'm published by Sting and Fly in Dublin. Yeah. Um, and I, I would really wonder if Stinging, Stinging Fly hadn't published me, if, any, if anybody else would necessarily. So, you know, I, I, feel, part of, I feel part of that. Um, I'm also quite aware as well that these events have to be given some title, um, one way or another. And I end up in quite a lot of alternative Ulster events. Yeah. Um, which involve, you know, three, four writers from, from Ulster who maybe have very little in common in terms yeah. of what they write about or in terms of their perspective, but because they're from geographically the same area, they get, they get put together. Um, so I suppose, I suppose both, really. Um, on the kind of subject of kind of who you are is kind of undivorceable from what you write in some way. And so at your memoir, um, it's, it's your story, but there's always going to be kind of political implications to that. When you were writing it, what were you trying to do? And are you conscious that there's some sort of responsibility to reflect the experience of Syrian people who've had to leave? Or do you just write your story? I think it started I, that I wrote it because I wanted to process what I went yeah. through. So that was the main reason. And I was like angry, depressed, frustrated and um, just when I, whenever I opened the news, I wouldn't see my story. I would see a million other stories that don't tell the real narrative. So I wanted to change that narrative. I wanted to process the trauma and I wanted to change that narrative and tell a different story, the real story. And the media was only focusing on one small side of that story. And uh, I, I started writing this book and I didn't have the intention to go through the political details because you really need an expert in that domain to be able to analyze what happened in Syria. It's way too complicated to put it on a, an author to write about what happened because it's, it is complicated and you'll never be able to tell the real story. Everyone will have a different side of that story, especially when it comes to politics. So I didn't, that wasn't the main focus of it. I wanted to write about the country, the home that I had before the war, and the human, uh, the aftermath uh, of the war on humans and human stories and lives. So war is just a small chapter of the, of the book, but it's before and after that matters uh, that, that I wanted to put out there. Well, one of the things that I was kind of, like it's a very moving book in general, but one of the things I was kind of interested in is you said that the only things you knew about Ireland before you started your journey here was from Cecilia Hearn novels? Yes. <laughs> right, which is kind of the role of, like it's interesting because it wraps into the role of writing as a way of transmitting identity and place, but uh, could you talk a bit about that? And were you disappointed, <laughs> impressed by how accurate she was? Um, actually, yes. Yeah. So I started uh, reading, the first Irish author I read was uh, Cecilia Ahern, and it was her second book, I think, um, uh, Where Rainbows End. And uh, I just, I remember browsing it in the bookshop, and I liked that it was written in messages and letters, and I was fond of that way of communicating. So uh, I picked that book up and I read everything afterwards. And I, I loved her style. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to, like I was, I think, 17 years old when I started reading to Cecilia Ahern. And uh, I never thought in a million years that I'll end up in Ireland, actually. 
And uh, the first thing I did when I settled back in Ireland, uh, settled in Ireland, I went to a bookshop and I bought that same book because obviously I left that book behind in Syria. So I went and bought uh, her new book from Ireland and uh, I have it in my bookshelf, in my, in my bookshelf and at home. So uh, I forgot what the question was. But <laughs> I, I was just intrigued just by the idea of like a book being like a connecting point to a place yes. and even a book that has no official, ostensible political connection to anything can have a political meaning in a weird way, you know? Um, I'm conscious we've left Emma all on her own over on the screen. So I'm like, I wanted to ask you, Emma, about... Um, uh, since you moved to the UK, so when you were growing up in Ireland, Ireland was a very homogenous place. And I was curious about how, since you've moved to the UK, your perception of Ireland and where it is politically and socially has changed. Gosh, yeah, that is... Um, it's, yeah, it's like... It's 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 phenomenal actually. Um, so I left Ireland in I left Dublin in 1998, and um, when I left, it was still um, like a very like socially conservative place. Um, it was still like extremely homogenous, although that had started to change in the past, maybe kind of about three two to three years. Before I left, we st I started to like actually be able to see, you know, um, that it was becoming more diverse. But this was like the very, very early stages of that, and it was, it was fascin. It, it is fascinating in that when I was leaving Dublin to come to London, London seemed like, you know, this place where. Um, you know, it was just like, it was so much more, there was so much more like freedom and it just felt like so much more like, you know, socially progressive. And um, Ireland, Dublin, you know, felt like the, the, the antithesis of that. And over the years that have passed, the decades that have passed, you know, since then, it's like there's been almost this complete reversal, you know, and like actually, Ireland seems far more of like a beacon of kind of I didn't like the, the the amount the amount of things that have transformed in the country to transform it from that kind of place that I'm describing that I left um, and the way things have like so badly deteriorated in this country um, you know it's it's just it's 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 just remarkable it feels like there has been like this yeah this huge reversal and then in terms of like um or yeah like kind of transference of, of positions and then in terms of i i think did was there another part to the question i feel like you asked me just how your perspective has changed but also the fact that ireland would have been a very kind of homogenous white non-diverse society and you were moving to one that wasn't um yeah did that, like, was that something that had an impact on how you thought about the place? Or had you all those thoughts already? I mean, obviously you had some version of them already. Sorry, did, did what have an impact? The change from a place that was very homogenous at the time to a place that was much more multicultural. Yeah, like I remember having a real sense of being like, um, of of being like, well, if Ireland just, if Ireland kind of had like more, if I wasn't such an anomaly <laughs> there and didn't feel like such a freak there, um, I was like, basically I was like, if Ireland had black people, like I would just, I would just stay there. And then um, I left and um, I kind of left around the time it actually started, that development like started to happen. <laughs> it was really like, uh, the timing, the timing was like quite interesting. But I remember like a few years ago, like kind of like looking home, like thinking about home and being like a bit like, oh, what am I doing here? I'm just like, you know, I could like the, a lot of the things I felt that had pushed me into, into leaving were no longer, um, were no longer so pronounced. And, um, I had a real sense of, you know, feeling like I should actually be, I should actually be back at home, you know? And um, 
when when lockdown happened and so I left London basically um like a year ago and um during lockdown we decided to leave London and I was I was ready to go anyway and I I like really 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 wanted to move back to Dublin and it was looking like that's what we were going to do for a while but then and I'm sure we'll get to this with later questions but I'll just flag it now the cost of houses in Dublin yeah. is so prohibitively expensive that moving back to Dublin for me was like completely out of the question. Um, so I, yeah, so we, we, we did leave London, but we didn't, we, we, I, like, I haven't gone home. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still in the UK, um, in, in, in Margate, um, which is like beautiful. And I'm, I'm obsessed with Margate actually. However, I do have, I do have like a, I'd say a constant, I actually do have a constant, you know, kind of sense of, of, of longing like for Ireland. And, um, but I feel that's kind of like, well, I, I don't know, I was gonna say that's, that's pro that, I mean, yeah, that is like quite a, a common characteristic, you know, yeah. I think of, of migration. I was about to say, that's probably how everyone feels, but I don't imagine it is how everyone feels, but I know it is, um, it's, it's, not, it's not unusual to feel that way. But then that sense of longing, but then being like, like I don't know, what would it look like to, to, to live there again? It's such a different place to the place that, 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 that I left. I feel like absolutely like formed by Dublin. Like I feel so kind of like rooted in, in being a Dubliner. Um, but like to, to, to fully live there, permanently again it, it, like yeah it, it, it's nerve-wracking I don't know but um, you know what if I could have afforded a house though I would have done it I didn't have yeah the I think we there. might I think there's an appetite to talk about housing so we might get onto that in a little bit um Emily I wanted to ask you about um just some of the stuff that's been touched on already about social change over the last few years and I think we were, we were on a panel about the essay earlier and there were, we were talking about how books like Notes to Self, your book of essays, um, to some degree it's kind of linked to those changes so there was like that came out around the same time as a referendum about gay marriage and a referendum on abortion repealing the Eighth Amendment, both of which revealed that Ireland was more than ready for both of those things and there was actually a conservatism amongst politicians. But when you were writing your essays, did you have a sense that you were writing in any way about those things? Or again, like, what is the responsibility of a writer to... Yeah, I'm going to say I'm with Wendy on the sense that I didn't feel that I had a responsibility, yeah. except to be as truthful as I possibly could uh, and to be, yeah, to be as honest. That was, that was my project really in it. The book, when Notes to Self came out, I cannot imagine it having the same, it was kind of extraordinary moment for me and for the book and, and for the country, no. <laughs> <laughs> it had it, been, yeah. it had been, I mean, 2018, like, it was like, after the referendum for equal marriage, it felt like a different place the next day. Yeah. It did, it just felt happier and better and like the majority had transformed things and said, you know, and Panty Bliss was, talk was t talking about this recently in her um, one uh, woman stage show um, and she had campaigned hugely in that uh, referendum. And she said, it's one thing to hope that you're accepted, and then it's another to know that you're accepted. And that transformation was absolutely huge for her. And I felt exactly the same after the abortion referendum. And I campaigned door to door, um, you know, talking to people. And I had campaigned in the 1990s divorce referendum as well. And I remember, like, so, you know, people on the doorsteps in 2018 saying, oh, well, what will happen if, like, if abortion is legalized? And I said, Everybody said the same. Everybody said the same about divorce. And the family has not fallen apart. Yeah. The marriage rate has increased. Like to, to think about this doesn't, um, this doesn't equal crisis. And I thought that was a, it was like a really interesting conversation um, to be having. And then, <laughs> but the other side of that kind of happy, you know, news is then the kind of per personal cost of it was 
that I wrote about in an essay about my experience of being denied a medical abortion because it had happened before the referendum and before it had been legalised. And it was a kind of really strange moment of exposing something deeply private for myself and my partner and our families, but also a weird solidarity with everybody who was speaking out and talking about their experiences. And so, yeah, I think, I think when you're writing, but also when you're publishing and then when you're talking about it, you tread these very fine lines between trying to be a private individual and then understanding the kind of public impact of, of, the, of the act of speaking, um, whether that's in writing or on a doorstep talking to somebody, asking them for their vote, asking them to vote for you. I think that thing about, I think in Ireland, people were kind of hoping and believing that things had liberalised. But in both those referendum, people got evidence of referendum. People got evidence of that. You'd, you'd have for years kind of conservative columnists saying, "Oh, Middle Ireland isn't ready for any of this." Um, and clearly, one, I was at Tara Flynn's one woman show, um, which you saw as well, and um, she was talking about she had campaigned a lot, told her story um, about having an abortion, and she actually felt quite depressed when she realised that the country. Not only was the country with them, the country would have been with them 10 or 15 years earlier if, if politicians hadn't been so conservative about it. So there's a kind of, there is a strange melancholy to that. I was kind of curious about, as somebody who studied writers, like, and kind of teaches writing, yeah, I still pontificate, by the way. <laughs> no, but like when you're looking at, so your book, I can see how you could very much make a case that, oh, it's very much in tune with the times and it's like clearly what she's trying to do is, do you, do you kind of sometimes look at how writing is analysed and you go, now actually they were probably just writing about themselves? Yeah, absolutely. And the, what, my funniest anecdote has nothing to do with Irish writers, but actually it's about Tom Stoppard. And he was being interviewed um, once and the interviewer asked him about his kind of his pattern of migration and his family's move and how English was not his first language and how there had been all these different languages in his life. And is that why he became a playwright who was just fascinated with words and with puns? And he listened to the interviewer and he said, that's, yeah, that's brilliant. And he said, but my brother is a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that idea that, yeah, yes, yes, it is, I think, the times and it is the context, and yet we are also individuals making choices about which directions we want to go in. Um, Wendy, in the context of Northern Ireland, like, there's a very different kind of history of change, right? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of cu curious, when you look at the last 10, 15, and I, I guess particularly since Brexit, what are your own kind of, what's your own sense of where Northern Irish society is? Or is it, I mean, and again, is the problem that it's a load of different societies and it's hard to come in? I think that's always the way it is, that there's a, that there's a, load, of, a load of different societies for, for definite. Um, and what, what we need is we need an assembly that actually is, is, is operational. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's so many people that want to live in um, a kind of like orderly, civilized kind of a way, um, but we just don't have the the leadership that is is you know necessary for the for the job basically. Is there a similar um, because in the north so much is to do with the assembly and so much mm -hmm. is to do with the legacy parties and all the rest? Mm -hmm. But say that kind of movement of social change that the south has seen, it feels like that that's happening too in the north but it's less discussed because other things I think, rise to the fore. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's absolutely like that, yeah. Um, do you, like again, back to that question of the responsibility of writers to reflect that, like, do you feel that your books are having an educational effect on people in the South? I don't know. It's a really hard one, Patrick, because I suppose, you know, some of the characters in my stories um, it's absolutely intrinsic to their experience yeah. that they live in a particular part of Belfast. So say, for example, I think of one like Lady and Dog, where we have a woman who's fallen in love with the wrong person twice. So first time round, she fell in love with a married UDR man as a teenager. And then second time around, um, she falls in love with a guy um, who is a, 
a Gaelic player. Um, and both times she can't ever express how she feels to, to anyone. Um, and in, in some ways, I suppose, um, she was, she's from a community that in some ways is kind of quite often in the media ridiculed a little, a little bit, you know, that anybody that's from a, you know, even a small unionist um, tradition is, you know, they're stereotyped as, you know, like super narrow-minded, borderline racist at times, homophobic, and, you know, people can be all those things as well. Um, but this is maybe a person that people could see that beyond these very local sort of specificities, this is somebody as well who um, is, a, is a complex and interesting character. So there's that, that dimension to it, but it's never really a conscious thing that I'm ever thinking, okay, so let's try and humanize, you know, you know unionist women in their 60s or whatever, or 50s. Um, but at the same, at the same time, um, you know, there'll be other characters and it's totally irrelevant to their story that they're from a particular, um, a particular place. And I suppose that's what I'm always trying to sort of guard against, that we see a sort of a homogenous Northern Ireland experience or North of Ireland experience, that there's a kind of a, um, homogenous troubles experience, that this is how it was for people in the 1970s. Well, that depended very much on where you lived you know, and what social class you were, and all, all, sort, all sorts of different variables. So um, it just depends, I suppose, on the, um, on the story. Do you think um, there, I mean, Irish people are often very dismissive of British people's lack of necessarily understanding of the mutual histories between the countries. Mm. But I think there's also a thing that people in the South are a bit in denial about, about how they've had a historic lack of interest in the North. Like when you, are engaging with like Irish people from the south. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself coming up against a lot of lack of knowledge and ignorance? I, but yeah, well, yeah, I do sometimes. But I wouldn't say it's exclusive to people from the south. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would think it would be reasonably reasonably widespread. Um, that it seems a complicated thing, a messy thing. People aren't interested. People think, well, sure, you've moved on since, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's okay now since the Good Friday Agreement, whatever. So I don't think it's anything exclusive to people from the, from the side. It's funny sometimes when you speak to people, and it's people that have been to, you know, all these European capitals and they've never been to Belfast. Yeah. Um, people from the side. That, that is, I do think that is unusual. There's a weird kind of sense that you know those pictures that they put on the weather reports in Britain where like the north is like a country on its own and there's mm -hmm. nothing connected to it like there's a kind of sense of that yeah. generally yeah. and it makes no sense in the weather report it's your weather tomorrow right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's another thing so like Ireland today is a pretty complicated subject but there's also this thing that Ireland can be quite solipsistic, and I think everywhere can be quite solipsistic, kind of obsessed with its own kind of internal battles and politics. And I think what I loved about your book is you bring in the story of people who are coming to Ireland. There's a mass migration crisis. You've written, a, you've worked in it as a data scientist, and you've looked at it, and you've kind of humanized it a lot in your book. Um, do you feel when you came to Ireland that Irish people had an understanding of the fact that there is a migration crisis, that there is a lot of people moving all over the world? There's, Ireland is, I mean, historically Ireland is very into the fact we were an impoverished place that, you know, but the reality is now Ireland is a country that's doing okay, apart from housing, which we'll go to in a minute. Um, but what was your kind of experience of coming to Ireland and maybe thinking and writing about migration in a country that was really kind of safe, stable, and maybe complacent? Um, I think it was a good experience because people could relate when I talk about okay. leaving home or not belonging or the migration crisis because it is in the history of the Irish. And mm. when I lived in a while, for a while in New York and went to Ellis Island, uh, there was this museum about the Irish migration and the uh, racism that was against the Irish in the U.S. and I thought, like, I felt that they could relate, um, feeling um, um, 
that racism against them and feeling, feeling maybe not welcomed and sometimes. So that helped actually them empathize when, when they would know I'm from Syria. Of course, occasionally I get those weird comments sometimes when I say I'm from Syria um, because of the media, because of the, uh, the negative stereotype that always make people think that Syrians are only living in tents or they are always called freezing to death because of all those fundraising campaigns. And there are people freezing to death in tents. But that's not the full story. There are other stories. I get comments like, your English is too good for Syrian, or you don't look Syrian, or um, you're too white for Syrian. I get weird comments sometimes, but the general uh, reception was that uh, people were uh, sympathetic and empathetic when they would know I'm from Syria, and they would be welcoming, and there would be uh, questions, concerned questions. And I remember from the first day when I was at the airport the passport officer, and there's a huge scene in the book about that, when I was always, I was worried that he would be questioning why I'm here, or that he would kick me out maybe, or not allow me to enter, but he was genuinely quest uh, uh, concerned, and he was nice, and he wanted to make sure that I'm okay, and that my family is okay, and he was welcoming, and every time I go to Ireland, if I'm traveling and, I'm, and I go back to the, uh, the airport, they'll tell me, welcome home, when they check the passport, and I always loved that uh, sentence, so. Cool. That's a, let's, we're going to have to move on to something more depressing. Um, but actually, I think we should move on to housing. Like, in uh, it's a, it's a, in Emma, in your book, um, what white people can do next. Um, one of the really interesting arguments you make is there's a need for a more collectivist left that kind of thinks more structurally about. Problems Now, one of the things that has happened in Ireland over the last 10 years in particular is what Ireland used to be dominated by two centre-right parties. They're now in a coalition together and there is a growth of left-wing parties. So in the main one being Sinn Féin. Is that the type of collectivist thinking? Like, is that something that you think ties into your book or is that a different kind of in the context of Ireland, is that the type of collectivist left move you need? Well, yes, in, in the book, I try and shift the emphasis of, I'm trying to shift out of the logic of kind of liberal, mainstream anti-racism <coughs> that roots everything in the um, kind of dynamic of privileged politics and individual interpersonal privileges and grievances about that and saying look the energy that is focused on this does not have the capability of transforming social relations in the way that they need to be transformed in order to not just combat racism but to also deal with the environmental crisis and to deal with the deeply entrenched poverty and inequality that um you know, just diminishes the life opportunities of so, of so many people um, in all, well, all over the world. And um, I was also very frustrated by how a lot of the social justice movements at the moment are actually pretty much absent of any class analysis. And um, they focus very much on, you know, particular aspects of identity but without having class analysis and without having any kind of rigorous um, uh, attention paid to um, the ways in which capitalism, um, you know, determine, capitalism determines social, social relations. So they're very, um, they, they just don't have the, I feel like yeah, they're not kind of world making practices. So I think one of the places where that kind of change that needs to happen can occur is, um, you know, yeah, at the, at, at the political level where you have um, politicians and governments who are committed to ensuring, um, you know, a, 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 a decent standard. So basically one of the proposals of the book is rather than this emphasis on privilege, interpersonal privilege, we actually need to redistribute 
resources, you know, and we need to look at um, everything from, you know, housing to like to 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 wealth access to access to opportunity and how that can be um, more um, equally um, distributed throughout our societies, which, you know, at, at, at the moment, like wealth is just consolidated um, increasingly consolidated with um, kind of increasingly small and increasingly obscenely wealthy elites. I was reading a statistic today that 40% um, of, I mean, this is the, this is the UK, but 40% of families, people in Britain are living in poverty or are financially precarious. You know, it's really, yeah. it's, 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 it's really stark. Um, so yeah, I think, um, politicians that are, um, or political parties, um, that are committed to actually tackling that entrenched inequality, um, are, are, are very much what is, what, what, what is needed in this moment. Yeah. In Ireland, it's all centered around housing. And like you said, you want to, well, the big factor of why you didn't come back was housing and I think yeah. the rise of Sinn Féin and the left-wing parties, I think it's sometimes misunderstood in Britain as something to do with nationalism, but it's almost entirely to do with housing. Um, I was kind of curious, Emily, like you're teaching mm -hmm. students and I'm kind of curious about, you know, people leaving the country because they can't find somewhere to live or they're stuck at home with their parents. Is it something that affects the young people you're teaching. Yeah, absolutely. It's and are you one. seeing that political kind of shift? It's the number one issue, I would say, in terms of educational access right yeah. now and third level access. Um, and so I have never seen attendance so low yeah. in my classes, whether we're talking about big like lecture courses of 300 students um, or small seminars of 25 students, it would be, it is now standard. And, and it's not just that I'm a deeply unpopular teacher, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it would now be standard and it's not just exclusive to UCD either. I'm talking to colleagues across universities um, in Ireland and also colleagues in the UK as well. And it's part of it is a post COVID moment, right? Where people got used to learning online. Uh, and, but most of it is cost of living. And so I have students who are just commuting from, to UCD in Dublin, um, from, uh, you know, the Midlands. Like, from K Kildare is normal, from, you know, they're all still living at home. And so they have two hours of classes, but they have two hours to get there and two hours to get home. And during those six hours, they can't earn anything. Yeah. And that's the crucial thing. And it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to justify saying to them, we have to come for this class, when I can see the hardship that that causes. And one student said to me um, about UCD, she said, it's like going to a casino. It's so expensive. Okay. And it, you know, it's a, it's a problem in terms of lack of grant support. It's a problem in terms of social housing more generally, um, but also specifically focused on student housing. Um, it's a problem with individual universities, but it's, it, it's really weakening a connection between, between all of the, also the other thing as well, my partner always says uh, the, the learning that you get in college is about 30% what happens in classrooms and about 70% what happens outside of it. And they're not getting any of that. And that's, you know, Got, got a real knock-on effect for the bonds that they don't get to create and the lives they don't get to live outside of home and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I, I, they, find, they, they find it very depressing, so I find it very depressing. Do you, like, do you see a politicization amongst them? In I, do in, I do in lots of ways. Um, so, you know, the way I, my kind of benchmark was for it was when I started teaching in New City in 2008, um, the, which I'd like to think was like five years ago. Um, <laughs> I was teaching a first year class and called Writing the Body. And I thought quite naturally in the, one of the first classes, I said, so, okay, so we're all feminists here and got vociferous objection to that statement, right? And that has totally changed. So now everybody wants to talk about feminism. Everybody wants to talk about racism. Everybody wants to talk about gender identity. And this is um, an intersectionality. And this is, and class actually, this is amazing. Um, it was the other day we were doing um, a play 
the fall from South Africa, which was devised by students at the University of Cape Town about bringing down a statue of Cecil Rhodes and decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing the university. And so as an exercise, what we did with the students was say, OK, right, let's start, let's workshop what would you write your protest play about and housing was what they said. Um, Wendy, like you teach younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm veering towards a kind of sunny-eyed view of the future. Are you seeing reasons to hope in younger kids? Are you seeing a kind of a different perspective on society than we have, or are they a bit ground down by circumstance? I mean, I would, I would see kids interested in all the things that you've just talked about, Emily. And so, you know, from that point of view, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's, that's a positive thing. Um, I mean, in terms of housing in, in, in the north, I mean, I think Belfast is much, it's more expensive than it used to be. Um, but one of our issues would be, I suppose you would say that the housing is essentially quite segregated, um, which yeah. does, um, again, poses, poses challenges for the, for the future. Now, no matter what, you know, ideas the kids might have themselves, they're still in this structure. It's a sort of a, I don't know, sort of like almost like a centrifugal force that kind of, is, is pushing people um, apart in terms of um, in terms of some aspects of education, also as well in terms of in terms of housing. Um, broadly speaking, though, I feel I feel really positive about about the kids that that I work with. You know, I think COVID has hit them hit them hard, um, but I think uh, you know they'll I think they'll be okay. I, we're going to go to questions shortly, but I did want to ask you. What kind of gives you? What would you like to see happening in Ireland in the next while? Like, what, what makes you hopeful? That can, you started with some hope there, and it gave me some hope. But so, I, do you have kind of a sense when you look around Dublin, where you live now, that there are things you'd like to see happening, things you hope will happen? The health system. Oh yeah. Could use some improvement I even, there. I should have just had a list of things. <laughs> yeah. Since we moved from housing, houses, uh, yeah, yeah, the health system, I, I hope one day uh, it will get better. Um, I was, yeah. that was one of the <laughs> biggest shock uh, for me in Ireland, to be honest, the, the health system. It, it was, like, could you talk about why it was such a shock? Like, what was the thing that you were surprised with? Um, I think the first time was when we had to go to the emergency room. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and just for a glass cut in the finger, my husband. And uh, we stayed overnight uh, for more than 12 hours yeah. um, just to be seen. And then we were seen by someone junior. He wasn't sure what he's doing. And it was very, very, yeah, <laughs> not pro very, very professional service. And we learned the lesson, like, never go to A&E. Just wait for it <laughs> to be better or go to your GP the next day. We learned that the hard way. and. And then, yeah, over the year, like uh, going through my birth as well for with my child, uh, that was terrible. Um, the mental health services, um, we have a, like we are on a waiting list uh, to, to see specialists. That's taking years. Uh, yeah, I, I still can't believe someone can stay on a waiting list for years to be seen yeah. by a specialist with, for any, any kind of service. It's all about the commons, the, the public yeah. resources, the, yeah. the state that we should own as a state. Um, Emma, just on that question, like what are the things, I'm trying to frame it hopefully, <laughs> but what are the things you'd like to see happening in Ireland politically and socially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'd echo that about um, the, the um, housing and the, um, the, the health service. Like even with the NHS on its knees, um, it's like, Incompar incomparable to I'm shocked when I go home my hopeful my hopeful moment is that I think that there is a degree of and we were talking about this earlier in various panels actually there's a degree yeah. of compassion in some of the public conversations that are happening so it's appalling that we still have a direct provision system but it is incredibly in hopeful I think that the conversations around direct provision and around Ukrainians coming to Ireland has been you know, much more 
kind of kind and welcoming and open. And I think that has forced a, a, a better type of conversation. Yeah. It's so far from perfect, but I think pe people's ability to care and there is something about being, and this is linked to what Emma was saying, there is something about being in a small society which 30 years ago made that, those conversations impossible and now makes them highly possible, right, because of the shift that's happened. And I think that's, that's, certainly, that's certainly a really positive thing to, to connect it's, to. It's connected to as well. We were talking on the essay panel earlier about things that were unsayable. But once somebody says it, when somebody writes an essay or speaks openly about abortion, about being gay or needing, wanting to be married, or like it suddenly opens the doors and then loads of people talk about it. And again, that's part of the role of literature. So uh, one of the things that I have been, um, you know, um, yeah, troubled, troubled by is like, so I've witnessed like a level of policing at, um, events that are populated um events that have like a lot of young black irish people going to them yeah. being policed in a way that i've never seen anything policed in ireland before like i was going out i remember like going out like you know I was going out all the time as a teenager and there would be no police there'd be no police presence at anything that we'd go to i think there's very very heavy police presence at things where there's black teenagers um which I just find shocking and really alarming and um, it really actually depresses me that relationships between um, black people and the police um, from other parts of the world it seems are kind of maybe being reproduced to a degree yeah. in Ireland and there's really no need for that to be the case because um, I really just don't think we have to import um, those kind of racialized dynamics from other parts of the world um, so that saddens and, 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 and worries me. Um, on a positive note, um, on, a, on a really, really positive note, like um, I think that um, what I'm seeing in terms of like, you know, this kind of renaissance of like, like Irish culture and Irish language that's happening and the way it's like, there's this great interest in the Irish language, in the Irish language. And it's like, you know, really cool now, you know, to be, interested in Irish to be speaking Irish or to be like learning Irish in a way that's so, so markedly different like from when I was in school and then the possibilities that exist or the possibilities that are created from looking at the world from looking at reality from looking at social relations from looking at like identity and our relatedness to um, our entanglement, you know, with the um, with the natural world and with the environment, from looking at all of these things from an Irish language perspective, you know, is ripe with potentiality and possibilities that don't um, present themselves, you know, um, through approaching the world through the the logic of the, the logic of English. Um, I think that development is 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 really in, like in, incredibly exciting, and I think that kind of process of you know decolonization, like a cultural um, decolonization, that is um, that is um, that is facilitated by that, is just a really exciting development. You know, that's kind of currently happening at home. Cool. I think we better go to audience questions because um, we don't have that much time left. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Like you can ask anything. Oh, there's someone over there. Um, thank you for a great discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask about moving forward in Ireland. So here with Brexit, one of the key drivers to that was kind of a backlash against immigration, um, the sense that citizens of nowhere coming into the UK were really progressing, but, but the indigenous British weren't necessarily. And do you think in Ireland with, in particular in Dublin, with the housing crisis, with big tech, tech companies coming in, a lot of immigration from Europe um, and elsewhere, and I guess, do you think that they could be that same backlash against, um, I guess, these citizens of nowhere coming and kind of maybe making it more difficult to live for people who are actually from Ireland? I, um like I, I think that 
traditionally, politics has been kind of, this is just my take, and like has been shaped slightly differently. I think Sinn Féin are a very complicated party that people have a lot of different views on, but one of the positives is that they're a post-colonial nationalist party, which means that they've never really adopted the kind of more far-right stuff, and they've kind of taken up the space in the south of Ireland that would normally be a kind of, might have a kind of right-wing backlash. On the other hand, like we should definitely not be complacent about those things. There is a, housing has created, there's an awful lot of, right now in Dublin, there's a, there's a load of far-right demonstrators have kind of infiltrated kind of inner city Dublin to complain about um, housing for refugees. And it's always like, it, it's, it's, it's there on the edges for sure. Yeah. I do I do think the relationship to Europe is fundamentally different though. Yeah. And that Ireland like Ireland's kind of movement out of the dark ages has been linked to its membership of the European Union. And that sense of identifying as being European is incredibly important. Yeah. And uh, the and the values that go with that. And those values are about progressive, out, like outwardly looking and connect it, connectivity and relate, so like identity being relational as opposed to separational, you know? I think, I think that bedrock has been really important since, since like the early 1990s and the, Supreme, the EU Supreme Court rulings around, you know, women's right to travel um, for abortion, around um, the legalization of homosexuality in 1993, like those things wouldn't have happened without the EU. And so those, that there is mu there isn't the sense that there is in a lot of the rhetoric about let's get back to you know yeah. basics no, or whatever the phrase is now, but like make it no great again that it was awful before. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's all go back to that. <laughs> and, and even politicians' rhetoric around the EU, like in Britain, it's kind of like oh they're making us do this, they're making us do that. The standard Irish politician was I went to Europe and I got a load of stuff. <laughs> um, so the, the, the talking about it is different. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much. Maybe this is a good follow-up to what Emily Pine was just saying. Um, what role do you see for um, a folk in the Irish diaspora? So, for example, someone like me whose parents came to London in the 60s and then now my sons who identify very from a very early age as London Irish and that kind of post-colonial analysis of identities is very common where we live in Hackney, you know, wherever you're from. So I just wondered, because many of us are now proudly carrying our Irish EU passports, mm. um, so much more attention on the part of ourselves to the, the links with Ireland, but I wondered if you saw any developments there from, <coughs> from where you are uh, in Ireland. <laughs> I mean, I think we all grinned quite a lot when we saw the passport applications go through the roof, right? <laughs> um, it, it did feel like, I mean, I, I don't know why I suddenly became a spokesperson. <laughs> well, because you mentioned you. And I, yeah. went, um, I, I think there's an interesting thing about the Irish relationship, the, the diaspora, is be, because, you know, like it's even had a huge impact on Northern Irish politics because the number of Irish American politicians um, uh, who strongly identify with their Irish roots. But I think there's also a kind of strange relationship that the state has, I've written about this before, where it's kind of like, let's get as much money as possible from the rich diaspora, or um, there's a lot of talking up of the diaspora without maybe always having the meaningful links with them. There could be more meaningful links, you know. I don't know Something that I noticed was quite yeah. interesting when I was teaching in the States um, earlier this year, I was like um, chair of Irish studies at um, Villanova University. And um, something that I observed that I hadn't, um, hadn't seemed so pronounced at all when I'd been in America previously was actually quite a lot of black Americans who have Irish ancestry. So are also part of the Irish diaspora in a way that, you know, hasn't been acknowledged or recognized um actually like a real rise in interest in um yeah irish ancestry amongst black americans 
and kind of conversations happening um, uh, in 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 those spaces about um, yeah being part of being part of the Irish diaspora. I think there's a new there's an organisation that's been set up, and there's different yeah you know kind of academics of kind of Irish and and Irish and black or African American black American um, academics who also have Irish ancestry, and the way that diaspora is being kind of um, uh, uh, recognized or acknowledged and there's also an interest I think maybe it was a kind of a taboo thing in certain ways um, but yeah there's definitely conversations happening there which I think is obviously for my work that's really interesting um, we'll take I think we maybe have time for one Can or I just two. say just something really quick yeah. about, it used to be um, that historically people um, would go to university from the north from Northern Ireland and then they would never return. Um, and they re would regard this as a lucky escape, you know, that this was their escape right out of the place. But I think in more recent years, there have been more and more people who have, you know, spent time somewhere else and then have returned. And I think that's wonderful. I think the more people that do return, the better. So if you're thinking, please do come. <laughs> we'll sort Except out the housing. you can't afford a house yeah. unless you're a millionaire. <laughs> Um, I think we probably have a time for one more question. So there was a girl, sorry, girl, woman, sorry, yeah, no, sorry to point at you. I know you had your hand up earlier. If we have a microphone for down here. Okay. I think this has to be the last one. Mm -hmm. They don't usually have to come onto stage and say stop. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, it's not much of a question, but more of an observation. Because I come from a country where, um, I don't want to mention its name, but you probably know what country I'm, I'm speaking about, that lately things have really gone to shite. And there, we had a, a, a massive abortion ban. Uh, we have a massive, a massive uh, inflation, whatever. I mean, when I'm hearing you speaking about the uh, you know, L, uh, LGBTQ rights, about the abortion, about everything, I can see that there is still hope. So thank you for that. Oh, wow. Um, thanks. Thanks a million for coming, and thanks to this amazing panel, uh, particularly poor Emma, who's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you.